Thank you. Please be seated. Good morning. Good morning. Eric says hi, sends his love. He's uh, on his way back from Portugal. We have these events that we've been doing in, in the UK for quite a while. ELA, uh, European Leaders Advance. It's now uh, European Leaders something else. <laughs> Alliance. Same initials. European Leaders Alliance. And uh, I have one that I'll be doing in a couple of weeks in the UK, but this one was in Portugal and Eric was able to go. So I'm, I'm thrilled. I love Portugal. Just love, love, love it. Um, saw a sign that was great. Uh, church, a picture of a sign at a church. The marquee out front said, <clears throat> it's too hot outside to keep changing this sign. <clears throat> I thought, man, maybe they're from Reading. <laughs> it's too hot outside to keep changing this sign. Underneath it just said, Sin, bad, Jesus, good, details inside. <laughs> that, that's, that's one of the best church marquees I've seen, details inside. It's awesome. <clears throat> the pastor dies, and he's waiting in line at the pearly gates. Ahead of him is a guy who's dressed in sunglasses, a loud shirt, leather jacket, and jeans. <clears throat> St. Peter addresses the cool guy, who are you? so that I may know whether or not to admit you into the kingdom of heaven. The guy replies, I'm Dennis, retired airline pilot from Florida. St. Peter consults the list. He smiles and says to the pilot, take this silk robe, golden staff, enter the kingdom. The pilot goes into heaven with his robe and staff. Next, it's the pastor's turn. He stands tall and declares, I'm Pastor Bob, pastor of Christian Life Center, Anaheim, California, for the last 30 years. St. Peter looks at his list. He says to him, Take this cotton robe and wooden staff and enter the kingdom. He says, wait a minute. The pilot gets a silk robe and a gold staff, and I only get cotton and wood. How can this be? Peter responds, up here we go by results. When you preached, people slept. When he flew, people prayed. This is the second week of, uh, I think we're doing, is it three weeks or four? Three or four weeks on the subject of prayer. I think it's, is it three or four? Anyway, there's more coming. Uh, my wife started last week with uh, a message on prayer, a wonderful word. And uh, they asked if I'd do the second one. And I, I, love, uh, I, I love so many subjects. I, perhaps the one that rocks me the most in some ways is the subject of prayer. I, when I was growing up in my uh, coming into early adulthood, uh, late teens, I, I hated reading. And uh, I read one book uh, my whole life through school. I, f I faked every book report. <clears throat> I, oh, I did. And I, I just, I hated to read. I read one book in the eighth grade about a hot rod, go figure. <laughs> I still remember details of that book that marked my life. I just want you to know. <clears throat> but I, I remember um, when I, I said that abandoning all for Jesus, yes. I became an avid reader immediately, and, uh, which was a miracle all by itself. I remember I would consume books, especially on prayer. I remember reading, I think it was seven or eight books, back to back to back, just just continuously read about prayer. So prayer, the whole issue of prayer, the privilege of communing with God, of praying, making a difference in the course of history is a huge part of life. So I, I have many things that I've taught on through the years, some that I, I, I kind of had three different things chosen to do this morning to see, flip, flip a three-sided coin to see which one to do. Um, but when it came time to speak uh, in the first service here, I, my heart was just, just turning towards one thing, and it's, it's not a teaching as much as it is just a conversation. It's almost, if I, it feels like a fireside chat. If we go outside, it'll be absolutely like a fireside <laughs> chat. It is hot out there. Um, I had an interesting experience here about a week or two ago, uh, and another experience a week or so before that. Let me just take you through them. Uh, about a week or so ago, I, I, uh, I woke up 
in the middle of the night, I don't remember now, use a restroom or something, I woke up, but I began to ponder and think about a particular problem that concerned me. And, and if you're anything like me, uh, the wheels get going and it's really hard to get back to sleep. And so I was, I was locked in awake mode. And the crazy thing is when you start, when you function like that, all you're doing is messing with problems you can't fix. You know, it's, it's just, it's got to be the worst waste of time ever. But anyway, I, I, um, I was contemplating, thinking about that. I just couldn't get back to sleep. And finally, it was maybe 20 minutes before it was time for me to get up. I, I dozed off and and as, when I woke, at that moment uh, I was to wake up, when I woke up, I immediately had this thought that w- my worship was replaced by worry. Worship was replaced by worry. Let me give you a context. Something that I learned to do uh, quite a few years ago was um, if I were to Uh, I've been asked like by our students and stuff, what's the strength of my life? If I were to reduce everything that I am and do down to one thing, I would say probably the strength of my life is my affection for him. It's my adoration. Um, Because it, it, uh, what happens is you, you find your heart just burning for him in ways that don't need works. Although I'm not gonna say anything correctly. So just get used to it now and sort out my words and make it make sense, all right? Just help me out here. Uh, it, it's, it's not a song that I sing. It's not my hands raised. It's not kneeling. It's just a burning heart for him. And, and uh, the King, uh, King Solomon made this statement in Song of uh, Solomon. He said, um, in the Song of Songs, he said, though I sleep, yet my heart is awake. And uh, a number of years ago, I, I learned that I could as I was going to sleep at night, I would just lay there and turn my heart of my affection towards the Lord. And in that moment, there would just be this engagement with him. I was just the sensing of presence and, and there would just be the, this engagement with him. And I, I began to discover that you have a better day if you have a better night. And, uh, and in Genesis, it says, on creation, it says there was night and day which made up the first day. So biblically, our day actually begins the night before. That's when it starts. It's, is at night. And so I, I, I've been learning that um, I just turned my affection towards him. And in that place of a presence, uh, such presence and peace comes over me, it's just very easy for me to go to sleep. And in that place, it doesn't matter if I'm on an airplane or, or if I'm at home in bed or you know, in a hotel somewhere, um, that's what I do is I turn my affection towards him. And just as soon as that presence begins to settle on me, um, just great peace. I just go to sleep. If I wake up in the night for wh- whatever reason, uh, it's been, I don't want to say it's 100% because I don't think I do anything 100% successful. Um, but m- the majority of the time, by far the majority of the time, if I wake up in the night, I instinctively, instantly turn my affection back towards him. And this particular night, I didn't. And when I got up in the morning, I felt like the Lord spoke to me and he said, worry replaced worship. Now I'd probably done that a thousand times in my life, but it was the only time I had him actually speak into the situation that I recall. Worry replaced worship. It'd be like sitting at a table and sitting at a table of worship and instead I chose to give seat to fear, to anxiety, to worry, all that stuff. And it, it, it you, you know, when you have the Lord speak to you, things become clear that have been cloudy forever. And suddenly in that moment, I knew. And it helped me to understand something that happened a week or two before that. If, if you can imagine with me, again, I've already said I don't do this 100% of the time, but, but it's, it is dominant. It's predominant part, feature of my life <clears throat> is this a sense of, uh, of affection for the Lord in the middle of the day, just driving down the street, sitting in my office, it doesn't matter when, I just consciously will turn my affection towards him. And he's such a lover, he's just drawn to that. And I don't know if he comes or if I go or if I just become aware, I don't care, I'll let the theologians figure it out. Right now I just enjoy turning my affection towards him. And he will come and he'll, he'll just rest upon me and it, it makes such a huge, it's such a huge part of my life, that burning affection for him. I love that song by 
uh, Martin Smith Delirious, my heart burns for you. That's just, that phrase is actually one of my favorite phrases in all of, literally in all of church history of, of music that I've heard. And uh, if you can imagine doing that day after day after day for an extended season. And then I remember um, I, I woke up one day and it's very hard to explain to you. How many of you remember when you were children, uh, small kids, and you, the first time you spent the night at somebody else's house and you felt homesick? Or you went to summer camp and you were just dying with homesick? I remember that maybe some of you are probably just glad to get out of the house. But there was a few of us that struggled with homesick. Chris was glad to get out of the house. I was homesick. So he never felt homesick. All right. Well, I have. <clears throat> I woke up that morning, this is hard to explain, but let me do my best. I woke up that morning and I felt homesick. And I wasn't sure why in that initial moment. I felt homesick, just empty. And I, I woke up and I began to ponder and think and I realized, oh, last night I didn't turn my affection towards him. Hard to describe where abiding presence actually becomes home. Abiding presence actually is like a room that you're in. It's like, it's like the place where you live. I woke up with that homesickness feeling. Thankfully, I could see it clearly, so I, I knew what to do. But the point I want to make is, is something about this affection for the Lord. The subject for today is prayer, so we'll get there. But what I have found in my own personal life is that being a worshiper is what positions me to pray effectively. I, uh, how many of you remember back in the caveman days when there was this thing called cassette tapes? Remember that? And even before that, eight track and yeah, all right. But we'll just go to cassette tapes. Just I remember getting a cassette tape of a teaching by a great man of God named Derek Prince. Anybody remember Derek Prince? Remember? Great Bible teacher, especially from the 70s. And um, I, I remember listening to this this tape. And in this tape, he was talking about worship and prayer. And he made this statement. He said, if you have if you only have 10 minutes to pray, take seven or eight of them to worship. And then he said, you can pray for a lot of things in two minutes. As, as crazy as it may seem, that statement changed my life because it marked me. It marked me with a value that if I have 10 minutes or I have an hour or two hours, whatever it is, if I have, let's say I have an hour that I'm going to take time to pray, I'll take 40 or 45 minutes to this day just to worship because you can pray for a lot of stuff in a short period of time. And I'd rather, I would rather live from that connection of presence because something happens in, in, that, in that moment. Something happens where you, I don't know, you subconsciously become aware of the heart of God. It's not, uh, I don't know. I, does anybody know what I mean when you, about striving in prayer? You, you, you strive to pray, you strive praying and you, you know, it's not that it's, you just pick up the heart of God. You find yourself instinctively praying his heart with insight on what he wants in this matter. And sometimes our prayers are even shorter and briefer. I, I remember years ago, I had, I had purpose. My aunt, uh, Helen, uh, talked to me once and she said, you should study the prayers of Nehemiah. <clears throat> and, um, and she called them rifle shots. And if you go through Nehemiah, you'll find quite a few prayers in there, but they were all one-liners. You know, when you're outside of that bubble of presence, you pray long. When you're inside, a few words changes everything. It's, it, the effect of your prayer oftentimes is the place that you pray from. Complaining is prayer in reverse. Complaining actually reveals that I'm losing the battle over my thoughts. Wow. 
complaining, criticism, resentment, all that kind of stuff. It just reveals I'm losing the battle over my own thought life. Say this with me. Rejoice always. always. Pray without ceasing. ceasing. In everything, give thanks. thanks. For this is God's will. will. Say it again. Rejoice always. always. Pray without ceasing. ceasing. In everything, give thanks. thanks. For this is God's will. will. That's 1 Thessalonians um, chapter 5, verses uh, 16. 17, 18. Let me read it to you out of the Passion Translation. Let joy be your continual feast. Make your life a prayer. In the midst of everything, be always giving thanks for this is God's perfect plan for you in Christ Jesus. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. And everything give thanks. Any situation that I cannot rejoice in or give thanks in, I'm losing the battle over my thoughts. See, one of the problems for us is that the angel comes to us as an angel of light. Okay, look up here. The angel of light, what does that mean? That means he will always come to us different than what he's trying to accomplish. In other words, he never comes with a red rubber suit, horns, and a pitchfork. (laughs) He comes, for example, a fence will come into a person's life because they think they're functioning in discernment. Many times people in prophetic ministry will be angry and bitter, but they'll call it the burden of the prophetic. <laughs> no, it's, it's true. I'm, I'm so thankful for our team because they don't function in that. But we have, we have history of being exposed to that for years. And it's justified because the enemy has come in like an angel of light. What happens for every one of us, our gift will determine what we're most susceptible to. But for every one of us, the enemy comes as an angel of light trying to sneak something in to our, our, our place, our, our hearts, sneak something into our heart that actually works in opposite of what we are buying into. So this whole notion of being discerning, I actually open myself up for a spirit of offense and resentment and all those things are actually outcroppings of, of receiving this angel of light, so to speak. What rejoicing and thanksgiving do is they completely dismantle that mindset. They expose truly for once and for all the root system that the enemy has, the the lie that he has used to persuade people to buy into a lie. And rejoicing, being able to choose joy. What does it say? Rejoicing always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks. So we have joy and thankfulness sandwiches in effective prayer life. Rejoice, rejoicing, and thankfulness are absolute pure expressions of faith. It what, it's what sets us up to pray effectively is the fact that I'm in the middle of a conflict, a situation I don't like, I wish I could change, but until I can honestly move into a place of absolute surrender and celebrate with joy and give thanks in the middle of what I don't like, I'm losing the battle over my thoughts. Amen, Bill. That was a very, very good point. Very good point. What happens to the person who, who learns a lifestyle, uh, a man named, uh, a Catholic priest from many, many years ago called Father Lawrence, uh, wrote a book called Practicing the Presence. And and his whole ambition was to stay conscious of God 24-7. <clears throat> he never claimed to have arrived to that. But the, his point was, is that whether he was washing pots of pans or he was in the prayer house praying, 
his awareness of the presence didn't change. And there's something about the, the presence, if you can look at it this way, there's nothing in heaven that is separate from the presence of God. Yes? So in essence, God himself is the person of heaven. And we are seated in Christ. It is a foretaste of eternity. It is a foretaste. I'm not saying he leaves us. I'm not saying we leave him. I'm just saying there are times where my affection, my thoughts are anchored in things that are very inferior. And it doesn't mean he's left me. It just means I have, I have I, I'm, it, it seems that all the things that I, I am born for are out of reach in this moment until I repent and deal with these wayward thoughts and these wayward affections. S stepping back into that place, it's not, it's not guilt and shame. That doesn't get me there. In fact, I, I had a thought this last week that, that I, I've got to work on, but um, the, the thought is this. We experience guilt and shame in the same measure that we overemphasize our role in our own conversion. We are susceptible to guilt and shame in the same measure that we overemphasize our role in our own conversion. Well, I found God. Yeah, yeah, you, you actually didn't. He found you first. <laughs> but I put my faith in Christ. That's right. But he gave you the faith to believe him with. <laughs> Everything the stage was set. He called my name. I responded to his invitation. He initiated. I love God. Yes, I do. But he loved me first. Right? And anytime we overemphasize our role in this equation, we are much more susceptible to guilt and shame because it's a product of not being enough, doing enough. But I, <laughs> this will sound kind of dumb, but I, I, I just in some way wish that, that we were just known as the church of the burning hearts. It's a dumb name, but I sure like the meaning. <laughs> I'm already in trouble. I don't want to change the name. Burning, burning hearts. But the burning ones, the, the, the people who, who know how to just, in that place of deep affection. I remember back, uh, how many of you remember the energy crisis of the 70s when there was the long gas lines and all that? Well, before that, so it's, this goes way back. Um, I remember uh, listening to a man speak. He said his home, he lived in a second, his, he and his wife, uh, their master bedroom was in the second floor, uh, second story of a home that they lived in. And he said, it just took forever to get the hot water from downstairs, water, hot water heater, up to their bathroom. And so what he finally learned to do was <clears throat> right before going to bed, he would just turn the hot water on just a little bit so that it would just constantly stream water, just very little bit all night long so that when he got up in the morning, he could just turn that thing on and he had hot water instantly. That's what a burning heart of affection is like. You don't have to work your way into the presence to pray effective prayers. You're, you're there. You're there, why? Because you carry a burning heart of affection. There's this, there's this continuous stream of presence, continuous stream of being one that burns for the Lord. It's, it's, not, it's not a works thing, although works come from it. It's, it's not a performance thing. It's, it's not just singing the right songs and all that stuff. It's just being conscious. It's, it's, you, you do that for a week and you're homesick when you miss a day. That's so all, all I know to say is you can tell. You can tell because things aren't as clear in your mind. Things aren't as clear in your heart. Your understanding of scripture is not as sharp. Why? Because it's not something you did wrong. It's not punishment. It's not sin. It's just we were born for the glory. We were born for heaven. That's what we're designed for. And all these little things that come in, the offenses and questions and you know what if you have a problem with an individual get a breakthrough in thanksgiving 
You have, you have a problem with somebody? If you can't give thanks, you're losing the battle. And here's the cool thing. You don't have to. You were designed to win. You were designed to win, to give thanks in that situation. The job you have is troubling to you. You know what? You can either be the victim of bad circumstances or you can be the victor. You can be the person who turns it around literally through the simplicity of rejoicing and thankfulness, just to give thanks. Consciously bringing someone to mind that you've had conflict with and giving thanks that God causes all things to work for good. And Lord, I do, I celebrate, I honestly celebrate the fact that you're able to use anything that comes my way. What I'll do is I'll actually look into that person's life especially when it has to do with believers. I'll look into that person's life and find the gift or that thing that they were called to do that has made such a difference in my life or such an impact on uh, this church or whatever it might be and just truly become thankful. Sometimes we're not thankful for people because we haven't stopped long enough to consider who they are in Christ. The Bible actually says we're supposed to fear one another in the fear of Christ. <laughs> to celebrate the value of a person. My dad would have this statement that's honestly probably one of the most important things I've ever heard anyone say. He said, wash a person's feet till you know why they walk the way they do. I remember being in a service, not here, it was somewhere else, and I'm not going to tell you where, <laughs> but far away. I remember being in the service, and it was worship, and it was, the worship was great, but there was just somebody close to me, physically close, that was just making all kinds of noise. I found it quite annoying, <laughs> because they didn't seem to be singing the same song. In fact, I had this happen once in another country where the, the gal would only sing in between the lines and would not sing the words. And she had one of them piercing falsetto soprano voices. And there were two teenage girls standing in front of her that were trying so hard to worship and then they would break down and laugh. And then they, they would... I, I watched them the entire meeting. They would fight their way back and they would worship God. And then she would right behind her singing this false song, just piercing. And they would find themselves laughing. And then they, I mean, they fought so hard. I mean, it was a well-fought battle. They fought so hard. When the worship was over, I walked up to them. I gave them both $20. I said, here, you earn this one. I did this. <laughs> Well, it was one of those meetings. And there was somebody over here that was just doing that, doing that stuff. And, uh, and I, I, I've, I've been around this mountain enough. I know it's stupid for me to think critical, so I'm not gonna think critical. I'm gonna press in and worship. I, and I, I didn't have hard feelings. I just wish you would stop. <laughs> Absolutely true. Worship came to a close. Heidi Baker stand, uh, standing uh, just a few feet away. She comes over, she points to this woman. She goes, isn't that amazing? <laughs> and then she said, 35 years as a prostitute and now she's free. All of a sudden, all that noise that was annoying was a symphony. (laughs) 
Heidi took the time to wash her feet and find out why she walks the way she does. And that limp became beauty, you know. See, it's, it's, that, it's that heart of tenderness towards presence that, that makes us more prone to that conclusion than all the others that we, that we run into. There's this crazy idea that the church is made up of Mary and Martha's and nothing would ever get done if it wasn't for Martha's. I mean, remember that story? Mary sat at the feet of Jesus. Martha was angry with Mary because she wasn't helping with the work. So I've heard people say nothing would get done if it wasn't for Martha's. And I'm pretty confident it was a Martha that made that up. I'm pretty confident a Martha made up that statement to justify their reasoning for making sandwiches Jesus never ordered. (laughs) See, something happens in the glory. This is absolutely true. In the glory, things happen at such a higher level and a higher pace and greater efficiency and effectiveness that you get done in one hour what might have taken days otherwise outside of the glory. There's something about being a people that cultivate awareness of presence, this glorious one that changes everything. I know of situations where that glory has shown up, where that presence, uh, because of the affection, the adoration of worshipers, that affection just comes crashing in around a crowd of people that are literally surrounded by friends to kill them. They are there to kill them. And then that glory comes because there's these yielded, surrendered hearts of lovers of God. And that glory comes and this army that is surrounding them to kill them fall on their faces. Every one of them get up born again. Every one of them get up healed. Every one of them get up speaking in tongues. Every single person in this group. Why? Because something happened. They could preach for 20 years and not get that conclusion. But when the presence comes in that measure, everything changes. And it's the ambition, should be the ambition of the burning heart, the church of the burning hearts, changing the name. Here it is right now. No, just, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, that's just between you and me, church of the burning hearts. <laughs> Saint burning hearts. No, no. <laughs> Something happens in the hearts of those who anchor themselves in that glorious presence. I want to read a couple of verses and then we'll wrap this up. Open to Matthew uh, 14. I've literally got just a couple minutes, but Matthew 14. <clears throat> Might be good to take a look at what impresses Jesus. Do you remember the story of the centurion in the Bible? He had such clear understanding of kingdom authority and unusual faith that Jesus stopped in his tracks and acknowledged his wisdom and his faith. Remember the Syrophoenician woman who was, refused to be offended at Jesus' comment that he couldn't give the children's bread to dogs. She overcame offense and stepped into great faith. Jesus stopped and acknowledged that faith. Do you remember when Jesus was ascending to the Father, his resurrection, he was ascending to the right hand of the Father to be forever with the Lord on his way, saw Mary out of whom seven demons had been cast, was at the tomb weeping. And Jesus was on his way to the Father and he was so moved by her love that he stopped the procession and went and communicated with her for moments before he went to the Father. What moved him? That love. In John the Baptist, Jesus was moved by the faithfulness of a man that would pour out his life for Jesus to come on the scene. And he said, he's the greatest of all the prophets. When John the Baptist is killed, It's in chapter 14 of Matthew. 
It says, Herod sent, in verse 10, and had John beheaded in prison. Verse 12, his disciples came, took away the body, buried it, and they went and told Jesus. Look at the next phrase. When Jesus heard it, he departed from there by a boat to a deserted place. We don't know what Jesus is processing, but we do know he had the same emotional framework that we have. The Bible says he was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. So there must have been some sort of a challenge emotionally, mentally, to this that he was facing, that he saw this man that he had just praised three chapters earlier as the greatest prophet, greater than all of them in the Old Testament. He acknowledges his significance. And now he hears that John the Baptist has been beheaded. It was so challenging that Jesus, the Son of God, sought for a place to get by himself. The very next scene, he's with a multitude and he multiplies the food. They are all fed. What does he do after that? It says in verse 23, when he sent the multitude away, he went up on a mountain by himself to pray. What's the point? In crisis, get alone with God. In victory, get alone with God. The very next story is it says, every person that came to Jesus that was able to touch his clothing was healed. The very last verse of this chapter. What's the point? Stewarding our moments. We all know how to pray when we're in trouble. We pray instinctively when there's a problem. People that don't believe in God pray instinctively when there's a problem. <laughs> if you're up there, right? But not all of us get alone after a great victory. And it's, it's in those moments, the metal that we are made of, so to speak, is formed. And the great breakthrough came following that second time, praying, get alone, when there's victory. It was in that next moment, now, Anybody in the crowd that just touches cloth is healed. It was such an extraordinary anointing that anyone that just bumped against him had access to a miracle. It followed not prayer in trouble. It followed prayer in victory. I believe this heart of adoration that the Lord is, I believe, wanting to impart for us today as a church family. I know I've made reference to this uh, for years, so I, I, I understand it's not new. But I do believe there's an impartation uh, today. I, I believe he, he brought this to my mind because in declaring it, there would be burning hearts all over this room that would find, would find it easy to just turn affection towards him, to anchor into that place of glory of presence, in that place to draw from this wonderful, wonderful God, and from that place see effective prayers. I want to shape the course of history with my prayers like you do. But sometimes the strength of our prayer is actually determined by the place I pray from. So Father, my cry for us as a church family, my cry is that you would impart a grace for this right now, that we would find our hearts burning for you at the most unusual and sometimes awkward times, sitting on the plane, in the hotel, at our neighbor's home, wherever, driving to get groceries, just that we would be a people that just knew how to cultivate the burning heart of affection that refuses to be offended, that refuses to embrace resentment and all the stuff, that just a people, Teflon people, because our hearts are burning for you, nothing sticks. Nothing of the inferior sticks to a burning heart. Nothing of the inferior sticks to a burning heart. God, I pray that you would impart this grace to us today. Amen. We're gonna, I'm gonna let you go in just a moment, but before I do, I wanna make sure that everybody in this room has a personal relationship 
with the Lord Jesus Christ. He came, he suffered, he died, so that every person here, our whole Bethel family that is watching online, everyone can know what it is to be born again. It is the most important moment of your life. And if you're, I need to ask for people not to be walking around because this is two persons a moment, if I can, except for those up here. If there's anybody here that would say, Bill, I don't want to leave the building until I know I have found peace with God, till I know what it is to be born again, then I want you just to put a hand up and I'm going to make an agreement with you. Right, right down here is one. Right over here is another one. Anybody else? Put your hands up high. It's wonderful. All right, I see you. There's at least two that I can see. I want all of you to stand. This is what I'm going to ask you to do. If I could have the two of you that raised your hand and any, anyone else that I missed or, or you want to get in on this, I want you to come right over here to my left. Uh, there's a banner and there's people that we know and trust. All they're going to do is talk and pray with you because I want to make sure that you leave with what you came here for. So just come on down, church. Uh, why don't you bless them as they come? Let's have our ministry team come to the front as well. Come on up. Ministry team, come on up. Bless you. Wow.